Well, let's go ahead and jump in and more people are continuing to to join us, but we have a lot to cover today, so we want to get going. So there's a lot of Feeding Our Future news. First of all, I'm John Hinderocker, president of Center of the American Experiment. I'm with Bill Glahn, um, and, um, and Bill really has driven the reporting on the Feeding Our Future scandal from the uh, from the very beginning. And uh, he's really the man when it comes to um, to this topic. And so we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, number one, most important, the first criminal trial in the whole scandal has now taken place. We'll talk about what happened, what the results were, what it means. Secondly, we have the incredible story during the trial of the attempted bribe of one of the jurors. We'll talk about that. What's the current status? And then yesterday, the report came out, scathing report from the Office of the uh, Legislative Auditor on the performance of the Minnesota Department of Education in the uh, Feeding Our Future scandal. And there was a hearing yesterday, which Bill attended. We'll be talking about that report and about the hearing. And then finally, we'll be, we'll be kind of summing up in terms of where the story goes from here. One trial down, we still have got a long way to go. So that's kind of a kind of a roadmap of what we intend to to talk about today. And in the meantime, as you have questions, type them in the uh, Q&A tab on your Zoom window. Type them in, uh, in Q&A. And um, if, if there's something that well, we'll generally keep them for the end, we'll try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. But if there's something that comes up where somebody's looking for clarification or something like that, and it seems like a good idea to pause and and answer that question right now before we continue. We may do that as well. So um, so feel free as we go along. Type your questions into Q and A. We'll reserve most of them for the end, but we might we might take up a couple as we go along. So with that introduction, let's let's jump in. First of all, uh, Bill, let's set a little bit of context for this trial. Um, how many people have been charged in this scandal? How many have pled guilty? How many are still out there? How many were covered in this first uh, criminal trial? Well, so far, 70, 70 defendants have been charged in the greater Feeding Our Future scandal. Of those 70, 18 have now pled guilty and been convicted of at least one count in, in the case. So we have 18 guilty pleas, 18 convictions. We have uh, one of the 70 died of natural causes, for real. So you have... The thing going on for several years now, lots of uh, defendants, we had one pass away. So we had a trial involving seven of the defendants that just ended a week ago, almost exactly a week ago to the hour. Uh, the jury rendered their verdict, convicting five of the seven who were on trial. And uh, that leaves 44 remaining unaccounted for. Now, as many as three uh, counts vary, three of those 44 have fled the country. They, they went overseas at the beginning of the scandal when news first broke and they have not returned. So that's 44 defendants left. But I, uh, I'm sure we'll dig into what's going to happen to those 44, down 41 with the uh, escapees. But we had five convictions in this last case. Two of the seven were acquitted on all counts. So they were all facing multiple counts, two were acquitted. So let's hold that for a moment um, and, and, and ask this kind of preliminary question. How are they breaking them up? In other words, are these seven random names drawn out of a hat? Or do these seven have something in common? Or how how are, the, are the prosecutors dividing up this group of people for purposes of bringing them to trial? So the prosecutors in bringing their indictments divided the people up into groups and the groups were people who generally worked together on a scam. Now there are some cross, uh, cross group workings. So it's not a clean break, but the seven who were on trial in this last case were all associated with a now closed restaurant in Shakopee that went by the name Empire Cuisine and Market. So all seven of these had been working together and their vehicle for the fraud was this restaurant in Shakopee. There was, to be, there was to have been an eighth defendant in the case who was also involved with this group, but at literally the last second, his lawyer became unavailable for the case, and so his trial was pushed back to a later date. So this was a group of eight, seven went on trial. The most famous group, the one that includes Amy Bach, who is the founder and CEO of Feeding Our Future, 
involved people who were associated with a different restaurant, one called Safari, and that was located in South Minneapolis. And that group has yet to, to go on trial. And there were other groups who are generally uh, were around a single restaurant or a food supplier, and that's how they broke it up. And as we saw for the seven-week trial of seven defendants, you had to break it up in some way because you couldn't put all 70 or all 41 on trial at once. It would just go on for months. So, so they're grouping them, uh, and presumably these seven people and some together worked together on the fraud, collaborated on the fraud, or at least were kind of organized around, what was the name, Empire? Empire Cuisine and Market in Shakopee. Okay, so we could call this the Empire Cuisine Group or whatever. And so there's seven people, and five of them got convicted. T talk a little bit about who are these seven people? How, how do they relate to one another, and who are the ones who got convicted? Right. So the five who were convicted, uh, two of them were the owners of the restaurant, the Empire Cuisine, Abdi Aziz Farah and Muhammad Ismail. They were the two co-owners of the restaurant. They were both convicted. And it's considered that Abdi Aziz Farah was the ringleader. He was charged on 24 counts and convicted on 23. And he was one of the owners of the restaurant. He was one of the owners of the restaurant. And then they worked with some other people who operated distribution sites or allegedly operated distribution sites. And those were the other three who were convicted. There was a uh, Mukhtaf Sharif. He ran a distribution site at a mosque in Bloomington. He was convicted. Uh, and then there were two siblings. Uh, there was Abdi Noor and then his sister Hyatt Noor were both convicted. And they had been working with this group, doing a lot of the, the back office paperwork and uh, warehouse work. The two who were, who were found not guilty were supposed to have been food suppliers and ran something called Bushra Wholesalers and had been wholesale food suppliers to the group. They ended up being acquitted. So the people who were convicted are the ones who generally were the people who sent those ridiculous list of names. You heard about the names with Jane Doe and Friday donations and serious problem. They're the ones who either forwarded the, the right. rosters right. of names. Those, those, those names are actually on the list? Yeah, so the, these names included thousands of people. A lot of them were just made up, but some of them weren't even names. They were just collections of words. Uh, to fill in the blank. And uh, so who got who got those lists of names? Well, they, they, they were sent to the sponsor, the, the lead nonprofit, Feeding Our Future, who then passed them on to the State Department of Education. Right, so, the, so the State Department of Education is getting lists of names that include nonsense combinations of words. What, what, what did you just say there? A couple of Serious examples? problems, Serious unique problems. problems. And so they must have their siblings, I assume. Wait a minute. Eh, I want to make sure our listeners understand. This is news to me. The Department of Education received from these fraud Monsters, lists of names that included things like unique problem, serious problem, whatever. And they apparently didn't notice that these are obviously bogus lists. Apparently not. The due diligence, again, was the subject of this report we'll talk about. We're going to talk about and, that. Uh, we'll get to that later. But yes, the Department of Education paid the invoice. There were multiple invoices. These names came up over and over. They just reused the same name. So over and over, they paid invoices where unique problem was receiving multiple meals from these uh, fights. So, so let's just talk a little bit about about the claims in the in the trial and the evidence in the trial. And I think we previewed the trial, if I remember correctly, at a prior webinar, didn't we? We did. We did. It was amazing. I, I you know, to my horn a little bit. Uh, the defense uh, strategies and and some of the prosecution strategies played out exactly as we discussed. So 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 basically, the the prosecution case was simple. I'm sure it required some complicated documentary evidence, et cetera. But the prosecution's case was that you billed the state of Minnesota for many many millions of dollars worth of meals that you claimed to have fed to impoverished children, but you did not, in fact feed. And the defense, the fundamental defense was, we did feed a lot of children. And if we made a 90% profit margin, that just shows what good businessmen we are. Was that basically kind yeah, of That, that really does sum up the, the two sides of it. The prosecution proved in five of the seven cases that the, the general uh, drift of the fraud was, we serve 10 kids, we're going to bill for 100. We serve uh, we serve a thousand kids. We're going to build for two thousand. So there was no doubt at any point that some children were fed. 
that that some meals were distributed, but the amount that they billed for was in way out of proportion to the amount of children who actually received meals. And they were able to prove this because they got all the bank records, they got all their invoices, and they figured out for every for every uh, dollar of of invoices that they claimed, they only bought about ten cents worth of food. And so they were able to do the math and showed that, but. The uh, the defense was, oh, no, we serve kids. There were real children who got fed. And why are we on trial? And and so as somebody who was present in trial a lot of the time, I don't think quite all the time, but a lot of the time saw the witness, uh, the, the evidences, saw the witnesses testify, the evidence go in. Did it seem to you that the prosecution thoroughly proved uh, proved that case? I, I thought so. But again, I wasn't there for all seven weeks. I was there for a lot of it. Uh, but there were 1,200, 1,200 exhibits in the case. There were millions of pages of documents. There were dozens and dozens of witnesses. And so, you know, perhaps they felt uh, there was some doubt introduced along the way that I didn't pick up on. So, so when the prosecution case was done and now the defendants get their turn at bat uh, to, to explain to the jury uh, why it is that they shouldn't be convicted and they really were feeding all these children... What happened when the defense turn came? Well, when the defense came up, their turn to present a case, only one of the seven defendants actually presented a case of their own. Mukhtar Sharif, the the man who ran the uh, food site down in Bloomington, he presented witnesses, including himself. He testified in his own defense, which you don't have to do. And uh, a lot of times your lawyer will advise against it. But he did. He got up on the stand and was cross-examined. He put on nine witnesses of his own. Uh, and he was convicted. He was convicted on most of the counts. So just to recap, the people who were acquitted were acquitted on all the charges against them. The people who were convicted were convicted on most of the counts against them. So the jury didn't buy 100% of the prosecution's case, but they, the, well, the overwhelming majority of it they bought. So the only guy to put on witnesses, he was convicted. Uh, the two who were acquitted, I was there for the uh, summation of both of them. And the, the lawyer for one he put up a picture of a, of a check and just baldly stated, well, that's not my client's signature on the check. And, you know, there was no testimony from handwriting experts or any of that. The, the lawyer just said, this check, my, my client didn't sign it. And then, then the jury bought it. that worked. That worked. <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, the, the judge in there, you've heard judges uh, give the jury the charge. They are very careful to emphasize lawyers cannot testify. What lawyers say is argument, but it's not evidence. And apparently, at least in a couple of the instances, the jury bought the idea that the lawyers presented evidence that they could acquit on. My life as a trial lawyer would have been much easier if I could just make stuff up in my closing argument. That's a luxury that is not usually afforded to uh, to lawyers. So that's that's what the case is about. That's in brief form what the evidence was. That's what the jury did with the with the evidence. Um, and of course, let's move on to the second big topic, which is during the course of the trial, there was this blockbuster news story as one of the jurors reported that somebody had tried to bribe her. Yes, this was international news. And it happened a little over a week ago, right before the lawyers finished their closing arguments. With, with the jury not in the room, the lead prosecutor gets up in front of the judge and reports that the night before, a woman in a Mazda, a Somali woman apparently in a Mazda, pulled up to the home of juror number 52 and dropped off a Hallmark gift bag. And inside the gift bag was U.S. currency, 50s, 100s, 20s, totaling $120,000. The juror wasn't home at that moment. But her father-in-law was home and, and received this visitor. And uh, the, the woman told the father-in-law that if his daughter-in-law voted to acquit the defendants, there would be another bag forthcoming. And so when the juror got home and heard the story from the father and saw this gift bag full of money, she called the local police. And this was up in Spring Park. Uh, and the po local police immediately called the FBI. And so the the upshot of it was this attempted bribery, if you will, of the of juror number 52 resulted in that juror's disqualification from the case. You know, so uh, she was she was booted off the jury, but good for her for reporting it. Well, then there was kind of a funny sequel because the judge uh, uh, was trying above all to avoid a mistrial. 
you know, after seven weeks, she did not want the... And she succeeded. And she succeeded. That's right. But it wasn't easy. So she decided uh, that the jury was now going to be sequestered. Right. And that hadn't been the plan before. And I was in the room when she told the jury that they weren't going home that night. And well, it wasn't really well received. <laughs> well, and but she also told them that they could call home and get a spouse or whatever to pack a suitcase and bring it out of them because they were going to be staying in a hotel for a few nights. And that... That process pr prompted kind of a funny sequel. Well, the one of the one of the remaining jurors, and they had a they had six alternates, so they had some to spare. So one of the remaining jurors, after the proceedings were done a week from Monday ago, she uh, she called her husband to say, "Hey, we're not come. Uh, we're not, I'm not coming home tonight. Could you bring me a suitcase because we're going to be in the hotel?" And he goes, "Is it because of the bribery?" And uh, <laughs> Well, then she had to report that news. She didn't. She wasn't aware that of the bribe or the bribe attempt of her fellow juror. She had to report that to the judge. Now she's off the jury, <laughs> right? So. But luckily, they all got sequestered and isolated, so there were no further incidents like that the remainder of the trial. So they got through with two alternates. They got through uh, through the deliberations and and to the verdict. One of our listeners asked a really good question, which is, can you describe the jury? Yeah, the jury uh, just, to me, looked like typical middle-class Minnesotans. They were, in the end, they were all from the Twin Cities metro area. And I know we had talked in the preview show for the trial that they could have come from anywhere from Minneapolis to the southwest corner of the state. But in the end, the jurors that were impaneled and seated were all from the Twin Cities metro area. And to me, they looked like fairly uh, good cross-section of middle-class uh, Minnesotans. Now, as it happened, one of the jurors who was excused was the one juror that everybody agreed was a member of a minority group. So, so there was an split. even mix of six men, six women, but none qualified as, quote, minority. And, and in fact, wasn't that the juror who got offered the $120,000 bribe? Yes, she was the one uh, non-majority member of the jury. Very interesting. And were the defendants all Somalis? In this case, in this uh, group of seven, all the defendants were Somali, at least of Somali ethnicity. I don't know exactly what their nationality was, but they're all of Somali ethnicity. All were born abroad. Uh, so none of them were born here in the U.S. So so when the bribe got reported and, and, and the judge took these steps to, to preserve the uh, trial and avoid a, uh, a mistrial, uh, as you said, it made international news and the FBI swung into action, you know, trying to figure out who was behind the bribe. And I, as I understand it, Bill, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I understand that uh, the names of the jurors had not been made available to anyone except the parties and their lawyers when jury selection was going on. Is that right? So, so the names of the jurors, so juror number 52 is the only way we know who she was. Uh, the But the members of the court, that is the judge, the, the attorneys and the defendants saw lists of juror names, not addresses, not any other identifying characteristics, but just just the names. And as you know, John, if you have somebody's name, you know, you can find where they live, you can find their phone number. Uh, that information is widely available for everyone. Little hint. Uh, so uh, there were seven lists, one for each of the defendants. And when I don't know why no one noticed this before, but when they went to collect and they were on pieces of paper separately numbered, when they went to collect the pieces of paper, only five were returned. So two of the list never made it back to the clerk. Well, do they know which two they were? Presumably they do. So it was interesting. You mentioned the jury being sequestered. At the same time, the judge sequestered the jury. The judge ordered that all seven defendants be taken into federal custody. They had not been. They had been sleeping in their own beds and coming to court every day. Uh, but until that announcement was made, they had been on their own. But she took all of them into federal custody. There was a dramatic scene at the end of that day when a whole squad of U.S. Marshals entered the courtroom, put all the defendants in handcuffs and led them out a side door. So for the duration of the trial, all seven defendants were spending their nights at the Sherburne County Jail, where the U.S. attorney rents some space, apparently. And until the end of the trial and during deliberations, the FBI raided the home of that ringleader, that Abdi Aziz Farah, searching for evidence of the bribery attempt. 
So, so it, it is possible that there's something else going on here. I mean, you, you can always speculate about different theories, you know, something that might have happened. But the obvious possibility, I guess, is that um, a, a defendant or, or maybe a defense lawyer, uh, probably one of the two who didn't return their jury list, um, that's an oversight by the bailiff or somebody, um, use that jury list to identify a, a juror and, and track her down and make the bribe. And I think that when this, this woman who came and rang the doorbell and talked to the father-in-law, she, she mentioned the juror by name, right? He was right. She mentioned name. her by name, not as juror number 52, but she said her name. And the only way you would have known her name was, this is the uh, prosecutor's, the U.S. attorney's theory, is you saw her name on one of those pieces of paper. Yeah. And so, so can we update? So the first thing they did was they raided the home of the ring leader looking for evidence. And I, I believe there was a second raid too, or a group of raids. Yeah. So, so the jury, the trial ended a week ago, last Friday, and the judge ordered the release of the two who were acquitted. So they, they were out of prison. They were out of jail rather. And so the, the other five to this day are still in custody. They're still in custody of the U.S. Marshals. And a couple of days ago, the FBI went and re-raided, raided again Abdi Aziz Faraz residence and simultaneously raided the residences of four of the remaining five who were convicted. So they have now raided the homes of four of the five who were convicted in the case. The, 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 young, the defendant, the sister, the Hyatt Noor, her home was not raided as far as we know, but the other homes were raided, presumably looking for evidence of this bribery. And if evidence turned up, we don't know. There we don't know. Any. All of the search warrants uh, are under seal. We don't know what they were looking for, what the probable cause they explained to the judge. All of that so far is uh, in secret. So I want to I want to get to the uh, future. You know, where where does this trial leave us? What's yet to come? But before we do that, let's let's talk about the report that came out yesterday from the office of the legislative auditor and and you're holding it up there i have a prop i brought a prop this week <laughs> and and then there was a hearing uh held uh in connection with that report also yesterday which you attended well, let's start with the report first of all it, it's it's by whom yeah it's a entity called the legislative auditor and maybe we'll get into this later in the program there's a an elected position uh in state government statewide elected officer called the state auditor I honestly don't know what the state auditor does because she doesn't seem to ever send out any reports. But this is a group called the Legislative Auditor. They work for the legislature, the House and Senate, the legislative branch of government. They have a very good reputation for doing high quality work. They have a very good reputa reputation for being nonpartisan. And uh, they have a staff. And this is basically what they do. They audit state agencies. They do those sort of accounting audits you would think of accounting firms do of state agencies and all the cabinet agencies. They do program audits where they go and they examine the effectiveness of state programs. Are they doing what, what they're supposed to do, be doing? Are they working as advertised? And about once or twice a year, they'll do these special reviews. You might recall there was a hubbub about when they hired this gal to run the office of cannabis, whatever. Yeah, right. And uh, so they did a special report on that debacle. But this report has been two years in the making. This is something the auditors started working on back in 2022 and finally released their report yesterday. And it was just looking at how the uh, State Department of Education oversaw the Feeding Our Future nonprofit. There were dozens of nonprofits who have been named in the scandal, but they only looked at how they dealt with the one, the name, the headline name, Feeding Our Future. So um, the title of the report is what? It is Minnesota Department of Education Oversight of Feeding Our Future. Special review. It's a very simple, uh, it's 120 pages, but the uh, the title says it all. And, and who is the legislative auditor? We should give somebody some personal uh, Judy Randall is her name. Judy Randall. Okay. Um, uh, Jim Nobles was the longtime auditor. He recently retired. And uh, Judy Randall, she did an excellent job presenting the report. Uh, as a, I think her name was Catherine Thiessen, was uh, the director of the division who produces this report. She was also uh, at the witness table for the hearing, and they, they presented the report uh, to 
a group, this is going to be confusing, it's called the Legislative Audit Commission. And this group is a joint committee, if you will, of House and Senate members. Again, equally divided between House and Senate, equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. And they're the ones who decide what topics the uh, auditor will cover and then are there to receive the reports and recommendations. So uh, with that with that prelude, let's jump in. What does the report say? It's devastating. You know, it's, it's a bad a report, as you remember, with the Minlar scandal or the Minshur scandal. And they are very careful to document with timelines and precision who knew what when. And so they document, and this goes back really to 2017 when this nonprofit was first founded, opportunities the Department of Education missed to keep, first of all, keep feeding our future out of the program and then to, to rein them in when they started doing the fraud and getting out of hand. So there were lots of opportunities missed. Sometimes the department says, well, we didn't have authority for that, but this has been going on since 2017. At no point did they come to the legislature, hey, we need subpoena powers. We need more investigative authority. No, no, they just didn't do that. And uh, is, again, Thoroughly documented timelines, dates. They don't name names, but there's a lot of identifying information in here. And I think they, I think they addressed some of the excuses that the Department of Education has made. Is that right? Right. Well, there were two. I'll call them lies because that's me. Uh, I'll call them lies that the Department of Education and the governor keep repeating about the scandal. And one of them is that a judge ordered them to keep paying the invoices that they knew were fraudulent. And that's simply not true. That simply never happened. No, I wrote about this at the time. I don't no, remember. And, but, but there's a letter, the, there's an appendix at the back of the report. That's the letter from the Department of Education to the auditor saying, thanks for your audit, but we don't agree with your conclusions. And one of their excuses was a judge ordered us to pay fraudulent invoices. That is false is so false that during the hearing yesterday, one of the senators asked the uh, Department of Education about that and their lawyer, their general counsel said, well, that's not, that's not true. That's not what happened. So, but the lie is still in the report. Mm -hmm. And the other lie that keeps getting repeated is we called the cops. You know, we discovered the fraud, which is true. They discovered the fraud back in April of 2020. In April of 2020, the Department of Education figured out who the fraudsters were and what they were up to. And uh, the department and the governor keep maintaining that they called the cops, but they have a very well-documented timeline, which I understand the Department of Education doesn't dispute that documents the cops called them. In February of 2021, the FBI contacted the Department of Education saying, hey, we're hearing about fraud in your program. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't the Department of Education bringing the FBI on board, hey, could you come investigate this fraud? So their excuses are not based on any kind of fact in existence. And I think the report documents something like 30 times when the Department of Education was tipped off when they received complaints from people saying, hey, you got to look into this. It's a, so it's a fraud. Over the years, and again, these complaints date back to day one in 2017. So from 2017 until 2022, the Department of Education received 30, three zero complaints about the Feeding Our Future nonprofit. And the department didn't investigate. In fact, they, they document in the report, the auditor documents how when the complaints came in, the reaction of the department was to call Feeding Our Future and say, hey, we got a complaint about you guys. Could you look into it? This is, no, this is staggering. Let's pause it for a second, Bill, because I saw this. You did a great post about this on at AmericanExperiment.org that that lays out a lot of stuff about the uh, about the report and the and the hearing. But this is really unbelievable. So the Department of Education, supposedly the watchdogs of the taxpayers' money, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. They get thirty complaints from people trying to tip them off to the fact that something is fishy at Feeding Our Future, and they responded to the 30 complaints, 30 different times apparently, by passing the complaint on to Feeding Our Future and asking them to investigate themselves. Is that Correct. right? Correct. And this is astounding. It's, this is, this is in the report. And, 
you know, they have excuses, they got reasons, and then maybe we'll get to that a little later. But another fact that came out at the hearing yesterday at the Capitol, and this is a Capitol hearing, uh, almost all the members showed up to ask questions, they asked very good questions, they didn't get very good answers from the department, I'll say. But one of the facts that came out was the auditor documented how an invoice came in to the Department of Education, the list of kids ran to 1,000 names, they claimed they served 2,000 meals, and the department paid the invoice. The documentation did not support the invoice. The documentation, you know, the names are fake. They, not that they ever read the, loss, the roster of names. Only supported half of the claim, but they paid the full claim. So, so the, the, um, the Department of Education has, has had a chance now to be heard at, at, this, at this hearing yesterday. What do they say about things like you got 30 complaints and you, you didn't investigate but just passed them on to Feeding Our Future and said they should look into this? Do they have some kind of a, I mean, that just seems inconceivable. No, they, they, they change the subject. That's their response. They say, hey, we followed all the protocols in place of the time and we followed all the rules and they, hey. Well, the protocol said don't, don't look at the list. They, they. Don't count the names. No, no, I mean, no, it, no, obviously not. And then the protocol says, go look at the sites. Go, go get in your car, drive across town and look to see if any meals are being served. That's what the protocol said. And they didn't do that. They said, well, COVID, blah, blah, blah. But well, here, I'm going to pause you for a second there, because this is something you've talked about in the past. You know, some of the claims that were being made by by these feeding our future defendants on their face, if you took if you investigated at all, were completely implausible. So you'd have a guy who lives in a one bedroom, second floor apartment who just submits documentation saying he's feeding, you know, 3,000 kids a day or something. It's just, you know, it's ridiculous. So, so when the FBI finally gets involved, they get, you know, they, they get into the act, an FBI agent goes and he starts knocking on the doors of apartments around this one. And, he, and if anybody ad, answers the door, he says, did you ever notice thousands of kids being fed in apartment, you know, 201? And people would scratch their heads like, what are you talking about? Right. You know? And so, I mean, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes um, you know, to look into what you're being told uh, and what's causing these hundreds of millions of dollars to go out the door, but they didn't do it. No, no. And again, one of my favorite examples, and I may be conflating a couple of different incidents, was a park down in Burnsville. It's just a city park. There's a little bit of playground equipment. There are no buildings. And the, uh, the fraudsters claim that what they did was they came once a week on a Saturday, Saturday at one o'clock and distributed bags of food. And so, of course, you know, some of the law enforcement people came to observe the park and nothing happened on a Saturday at one o'clock. And they said, oh, we decided to do it on Friday this week. And 3,000 parents showed up yesterday and you just missed it because you weren't here yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's this and ever shifting excuses. Them? Well, apparently that, that was good enough for the department. Uh, but yeah, so their, their excuse was we don't. We don't blame. We don't assign blame. We don't point fingers. That's not what we're about. I mean, we we, had a, we got to pause on this too, Bill, because you were explaining this to me earlier this morning. It's just absolutely unbelievable. The current uh, uh, commissioner of education is a guy named Willie Jett. Now, Willie Jett was not there at the time when no, no. To be events. clear, there, there were two uh, witnesses for the department today at the he- uh, yesterday at the hearing. One was Willie Jett. He is the current commissioner of education. And then his top lawyer, the general counsel for the agency, she was there as well. Neither of them were employed by the agency at the time any of these events occurred. So the people we would really want to talk to, the old commissioner, the old uh, chief counsel, they've moved on. So what we have are these newbies showing up saying, well, we weren't there, but we'll try to answer your questions as best we can. So this is this is really wonderful. So so somebody and this is at least one or two of our of our listeners have asked this question. You know, somebody at this hearing yesterday asked, well, have any Department of Education employees been fired or disciplined or, or something for, you know, for the uh misfeasance that's documented in this report. And Willie Jett's response was along the lines of, that's not who I am. I don't point fingers. Yeah, but he, he spoke in the third person. So his, his response was, he didn't answer the question. The answer is zero. The answer is nobody from the Department of Education has been disciplined or demoted 
or reprimanded or fired or had any negative repercussion of this quarter billion or more of uh, your taxpayer dollars going out the door. So nobody within the Department of Education suffered at all from the scandal. And uh, Commissioner Jett's response was, that's not who Willie Jett is. That's oh not what God. Willie Jett is about. <laughs> and his response was, we're all for accountability. We want accountability, but that's not our version of accountability. We don't point fingers. We don't cast blame. We don't hold any individual accountable for this. And uh, uh, one of the members of the committee, Patty Anderson, she's a Republican, represents Delwood in the eastern suburbs. She coincidentally had been an elected state auditor of Minnesota back in the day. And she says, don't worry, Commissioner, about assigning blame. There'll be plenty of that over here on this side of the table. And you know, his response was, we don't want to, he's, I'm an educator. I'm about educating children. I'm not about assigning blame, but I don't know. That's, that's how I understood accountability worked, <laughs> that we hold individual people, put their feet to the fire and hold them individually accountable. I've, I don't, maybe I'm too old and can't learn new things. I don't understand this collective non-judgmental accountability as a concept. I, there's, there's a kind of genius at work here, though. I mean, it's just, here they are. These people have been obviously asleep at the switch. Probably a half a billion dollars in fraudulent money went out the door on their watch. Now the OLA has, has, has filed this scathing report on their total malfeasance, misfeasance of duty. Don't forget nonfeasance. <laughs> yes, nonfeasance too. And, and so all over the state of Minnesota, people are saying, well, somebody's head should roll. I mean, really the old commissioner's head should have rolled. But, and, but when asked the question, uh, Willie Jett says, that's not who Willie Jett is. I don't point fingers. In other words, no, we do not have accountability in the Tim Walls administration. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned his name because we haven't heard one word from Governor Walls or Lieutenant Governor Flanagan about this report. And the buck has to stop somewhere. And so I'll give a credit to a Democrat, Senator Ann Rest of New Hope. She was on the committee and she asked the question, uh, where does the buck stop? And then she made a little speech, like as far as she can tell, the buck never stopped moving. It's been running down the street and disappearing over the horizon or something to that effect. So that was a Democrat. She asked several times, Do, does the Department of Education agree with the recommendations in the report and didn't get an answer? So uh, the buck has to stop somewhere. Governor Tim Walls, he is the chief executive officer of the state. He was elected to be in charge he appointed Willie Jett and Willie Jett's predecessor as commissioner of education. And he was out of town and unavailable for comment. And that seemed to be good enough for local media. So, so how is it that people like the commissioner of education think they can get away with responding to a question about, has there, have there been any consequences for any of the people, you know, who, 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 who allowed this uh, scandal to happen, and he says that's not who Willie Judd is. It seems to me, Bill, that if you ask yourself, how in the world do they think they can get away with that? The answer is, we don't have a press in Minnesota. They don't get away with it. That's how yeah, they, they know do, they yeah, can get away right, with it. Exactly. And, and Tim Wallace doesn't make a statement because he doesn't feel obligated to. Unlike the Commissioner of Education, he was in office when all these things happened. He's the person with whom the buck normally would be assumed to stop, and he doesn't feel obliged even to make a comment. And it seems to me that part of, part of the reason for that, at least, is you know, we don't have a press in this state. If we had newspapers in Minnesota, if we had television news operations in Minnesota, then there would be someone on hand to ask questions of people like Tim Walls uh, and, and not just take uh, Willie Jets. That's not who I am as an adequate response. And where, where's the Daily Mail when you really need them? Yeah, if you want to know what's happening in Minnesota, you got to read the Daily Mail out of um, out of London. Well, let's let's move on to one more topic, uh, Bill, and then and then uh, open it up to to audience questions, which we've got a lot of that have been uh, accumulating here over the course of the of the webinar. We'll get to as many as we as we can. And I guess the last the last question is uh, where do we go from here? You know. There were a lot of defendants that started out. There's still a lot left. And by the way, the statute of limitation is not run. 
correct? Correct. We, we, we looked this up the other day. We think it's five years, so we got at least another year, maybe two on the statute of limitations. And so there is the potential that more defendants could yet be charged. I fully expect there'll be more indictments in this case. Every time the United States attorney, whose name is Andy Luger, every time he's in front of a TV camera and is asked about this, he says, more to come. There will be more indictments. We haven't gotten to the end of this. So I fully expect there'll be more people charged beyond the 70 who've already been charged. And one thing, I don't want to go into detail on this, Bill, but I think it's something that you wrote about at least once on our website. There, there were three umbrella organizations that participated in this, you know, free food for children program. One of them was Feeding Our Future. They're kind of the famous one. The scandal got named after them. But there's a second one called Partners in Nutrition. And there have also been a number of people charged who are under the Partners in Nutrition umbrella. Right. right. Not, not employees of that nonprofit, but people who worked with that nonprofit. So you're right. There were three, the three biggest nonprofits involved in the free food programs were all shut down by the Department of Education when the scandal broke. And Feeding Our Future is what we call a whole scandal, but it's not just that nonprofit. That nonprofit did about $240 million of business its last two years. A second nonprofit, Partners in Nutrition, did around $200 million of business its last two years. Nobody who worked for that organization has been charged. There was a third group. But, but people who were under that the umbrella. The people who were under charged. that umbrella have been charged, including many of the ones who were just convicted. Some of the ones, the five who were just convicted, got money from the state through Partners in Nutrition. There was a third group, the third biggest group, much smaller. It was called Gargar Family Services. They were shut down by the Department of Education. And there's some links between them and the other two groups. You add them together, that was more than 70, 70% of the entire free food program in the state of Minnesota. But, but so far, at least, nobody in that third umbrella organization, either an employee or anybody under their umbrella, has been charged. Is that right? Uh, with one exception, one of their food vendors is one of the guys who fled the country. But yes, the, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, nobody's been charged, and maybe nobody ever will be. Maybe they've decided they were just in the misfeasance category, not the malfeasance category. So, so, so in any event, whether there are more indictments brought or not, there are still a bunch more defendants yet to go. What, well, what's up next? Are there more trials on the calendar? There are more trials scheduled. In fact, uh, the, the lead group uh, with Amy Bach and the Safari Restaurant folks, there are 13 or 14 in that group. They were supposed to go on trial very soon, and they're in pretrial motions, but they haven't scheduled a start date yet. There was a start date scheduled for August for a third group, and a fourth group was supposed to go on trial beginning in November. Now, since the bribery attempt, the uh, U.S. attorneys filed in a couple of these other cases asking for delays because the they say all of their efforts, all of the FBI's efforts are focused on finding out who tried to bribe the juror. So they're 100 percent on the job of finding the briber and don't have time to do filings in other cases. So it might end up being some of these other trials get pushed back, but we expected two trials, maybe three to begin before the end of the year. There were trials stacked up for early 2025. And with more cases, this will continue on years into the future. So at this point, do we have any clear understanding of when the second trial is likely to be, or is that just... Well, November? it's still, it's, the next trial is still scheduled for a date in August, and maybe they'll be able to maintain that. But, uh, you know, we if this... Uh, case about the the bribery drags out maybe they won't make that date and amy bach is one of the defendants in that case no not in that group. oh okay she she might get pushed back even farther okay so so let's talk just a little bit about the consequences of this of this verdict where there were five convictions including the guy who was considered to be the ringleader two acquittals um the, what, do, what do you think that means in terms of um Future prosecutions, are, are some of these defendants going to be emboldened to try to go to trial because a couple of got off? Or is the government may, maybe going to reevaluate its claims against certain categories of defendants? Or what do you think the implications are? Well, I think all, that, all the above. So if I were a defendant and the set of facts for my case looked a lot like the defendants who were convicted, 
I would want to make my best deal. I wouldn't want to go to a I see what happens if you go take it to a jury. Huh? That set of facts ends up in convictions. Now, you, you were correct. There were two who were acquitted. Now, maybe if my set of facts looks like the guys who got acquitted, maybe I do want to go to trial. Maybe I don't want to make a deal. But again, it's a, it's a, everybody's in a continuous learning environment. So the, the prosecutors now know what works and what doesn't work. So they know for people who are maybe back office folk, people who are in the background, what evidence they need to present that will get a conviction the next go around. So maybe they'll sharpen their pencil, get a little smarter. Again, with seven, there were 64 separate verdicts, 41 counts and seven defendants. And so they didn't always put a lot of emphasis on some of these, you call them more minor charges. Maybe they won't make that mistake going forward. So I suspect we'll see more guilty pleas, uh, but there are definitely, I'm pretty sure, more trials in our future. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to the uh, audience questions and let's make this kind of a lightning round. We'll try to get to as many of these uh, questions and give them the, the best kind of short answers that we can. So, so here's the first one that came out. Uh, who was the judge who the Department of Education blamed for its inaction? That was a, I forget the name, but it was a Ramsey uh, John County. John Gutman. Gutman, okay. It was a Ramsey County District Court judge. And but as but as Mel said, oh, that was just a lie. It it is not true. Yeah. So so feeding our future sued the state because the state wasn't approving applications for new feeding sites. The state had a very good reason why they weren't approving new applications because they knew this was a fraudulent organization. But what the judge ruled in the case was there is a process, due process. There are rules. You can say yes, you can say no, but you have to follow the rules. And the, what the judge ruled was, you can't have no answer be your answer. Yes can be an answer, no can be an answer, but there has to be an answer. So they didn't hold the department in contempt because they were trying to prevent fraud. The, uh, the department was uh, being threatened with contempt because they weren't following the rules of the program. At no point did the judge say, you have to pay fraudulent invoices. The judge says there's a process for paying or refusing to pay invoices. There is a process for approving or rejecting an application. Follow the process. But as bureaucrats just want to not have an answer because then the problem isn't a problem. If they come to an answer, now they have to go to the Court of Appeals and defend their work. Here's a good question that I'm sure has occurred to, to a number of people, and that is, are there defendants here who could either lose their U.S. citizenship, I don't think that can happen, or be deported. How about that? I don't think any of them would as a result of this case. Uh, and I say that because I think the grounds for deportation, they're, I believe, all American citizens or naturalized all American citizens, but that's not the case of all 70 defendants. In fact, there is a defendant who has a, I know this for a fact, because they tried to deport him about 10 years ago and failed. He is a permanent resident a green card holder. And if he is convicted in this case, he would be subject to deportation proceedings. The problem being Somalia doesn't accept deportees. Some of these countries that they would be subject to deportation to just refuse to accept any of their citizens back. So you have- Well, why would anybody ever accept uh, deportees who've been convicted by a crime? Well, you know, if you're a functioning society, there should be consequences for that. We're going to we're going to hike tariffs on your we're going to refuse visas to you or your diplomat to your citizens or diplomats. We live in a global society and you get all the benefits of being in the society and none of the obligations. Well, diplomacy needs to they need to play some hardball. Yeah. Well, here's a kind of an obvious question that I didn't think to ask and and maybe we don't have a good answer yet, but what kind of sentences uh, can can these uh, convicted defendants uh, look forward to? Do we have any insight there? Well, the, they're subject to decades in prison. And that's if you add up all the counts, twenty three counts convicted in one instance, all the the maximum, uh, you know. But that's not what's going to happen. Yeah, that's they're like Donald Trump. They're they're all first time offenders for the most part. They're first time offenders. There'll be downward departures. Sentences will run concurrently or rather than consecutively. So probably years in prison, probably not decades in prison, but we don't know because 23 guilty pleas, five convictions, 
Not a single sentence has been handed down yet in the case. All right, so we we can we can speculate, but we just don't know. Right. We we don't have a uh, we don't have a case study gonna... to extrapolate from. Yeah, and by the way, when these people get sentenced, when's that going to be? Well, again, I think it's six months out. I think that's the general time frame for these for these events. They have not sentenced. They have not set a date. Not only have no has no one been sentenced. No sentencing dates have been set. So are they waiting until all these cases have been processed and then do all the sentencing at once? Yeah, maybe, but I I don't know how that works. I don't know. That that seems very strange to me. I would think that if if, uh, some of these convicted defendants got the book thrown at them, it would prompt more guilty pleas. I guess we'll see in the next few months. Uh, Interesting. Okay, uh, well, here's a question uh, by anonymous attendee. How many in the Department of Education will be held responsible? Well, zero. Zero. It's an easy one. Next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, he, here's a good question, too. This is another excuse that I'd kind of forgotten about, but that we heard about a year or two ago. Does the audit deal with Attorney General Ellison's claim that his office couldn't disclose the Freeding Our Future fraud because the FBI told him he couldn't. Uh, I, I've i never bought that excuse, and that wasn't in the scope of the report. The scope didn't look at the, uh, the Attorney General's office. It only looked at the Department of Education. But I don't know. I, I find that a, a very flimsy excuse. And that that was an excuse. They said, we have to let the fraud happen so we don't tip off the fraudsters that they're under investigation. So that might have been an excuse for a month of invoices being paid, but not eight, nine, ten months of invoices. Well, not for being $500 paid. million dollars worth of fraud. $500 million dollars went out the door because they said, we don't want to tip off the subjects of the investigation. There's got to be some sort of balance test where you say every month, millions, if not tens of millions are going out the door versus not having as strong a case against the defendants. There's got to be somebody looking out for the public purse. So one of our uh, attendees asked about um, this, this fraud and the broader picture of fraud, like daycare during the Dayton administration and so on. And I, we, don't, we don't want to go off on a big digression about other instances of fraud, but I, I do want to make this, I ask you this question, Bill. I mean, isn't it true that we have seen over the last decade or 12 years, whatever it's been, you know, a pattern of the Minnesota state government being massively defrauded, seemingly with not many consequences. Uh, Yes, yes. And to say something nice about Keith Ellison, in the last year or so, he's been going after some of these fraudsters. He's been prosecuting fraudsters who have been stealing from the uh, PCA program, the uh, personal care attendant program. He's been prosecuting people stealing from the it's called a non-emergency medical transportation. People being driven to doctor's appointments. He's been going after that scam. There's the child care scam that the OLA did a report on several years ago. There's been scandal after scandal after scandal. It seems like all of these programs are subject to attack on industrial, from industrial scale fraud. And little is being done. And that actually came up at the hearing yesterday. Because it's been documented. Uh, Minnesota... Uh, Reformer and the Star Tribune have documented a, that about half of these 70 defendants had other businesses, child care, adult daycare, PCA, you name it. They had other businesses doing business with the state, mostly the Department of Human Services. And we have documented over and over where a fraudster pled guilty or has now been convicted and they had a food site, but they also had a child care site. That child care site is still operating, still getting money from the state. And the Department of Human Services has said, well, just because they defrauded this other agency doesn't mean we can shut them down. We have our own process and our own procedures, which have to play out. But we have, it seems like for every dollar stolen from the food program, these fraudsters were stealing another dollar from some other program. And that was a subject and in fact, one of those senders said, well, maybe we need to change the law so these agencies have to talk to each other. And another amazing fact that came out in the report was mandatory fraud reporting. If you are a state employee, if you are employed by the state of Minnesota, you have a mandatory legal obligation under statute. I know that was redundant. You have an obligation to report fraud to this legislative auditor. Somebody asked the legislative auditor, when did you hear first about the fraud. And she said, when I read the the newspaper story about the FBI rates. So 
you were saying the Department of Education, their defense says we found the fraud a year before, two years before. They have a legal obligation to tell the auditor and they did not do it. Here's a question that I'm sure has occurred to people, uh, other people as well. Can you comment on whether the defendants are U.S. citizens? Most of them are. Uh, most of them are. As I mentioned, this batch that none of them were born in the U.S. I think they were all U.S. naturalized U.S. citizens. I think most of the 70 defendants are U.S. citizens. I know for a fact they aren't all. And they aren't going to be subject to a deportation. If they are, even if they're convicted in this case, I think the only way... You as a citizen would be subject if you committed fraud in the process of becoming a citizen. Right. Right. Once you're a citizen, you commit a crime, you, you know, you go to prison or whatever for the crime, but you can't, you know, you can't deport a citizen. Right. Unless, unless so. part of your crime was committing fraud in becoming a citizen. Exactly. You lied about your identity. Exactly. Or, right. Or right. Lied about your prison so your record. citizenship gets revoked or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, Here's a good question. Uh, are the documents that were presented during the trial available to the public? You know, as you said, there's a whole bunch of exhibits. Is there a, a, you know, a place where, where the public can go and, and see that evidence? Uh, the short answer is no. There were 1,200 exhibits introduced during the case. Out of 1,500 that, that were declared and numbered. Now, the only way I've seen the actual documents and some of them are just photographs of a building, you know, you, you know, that's, but the, the banking records aren't public. Uh, a lot of the other documents, unless they were included in the indictment as an exhibit, uh, as a picture or included as a picture at a search warrant, there was a lot of fighting between ba uh, lawyers back and forth about the admissibility of a specific exhibit. And in order to argue about it, they would have to put that exhibit in the in the brief or their motion. So some of it you've seen, and then the attorneys, if you were in the room, as I was for many days of the trial, they were put up on a big screen TV. So you could be, if you were a spectator in the room, you could see the exhibit up on the TV or watch the video as it's played on the TV. But you had to be in the room or you could go through the record and sometimes these exhibits are used as part of an argument by, by a lawyer. But the bulk of the 1,200 exhibits are not public data. Well, it's just about one o'clock. Let's see if we can do maybe, um... well, here's, here's you know, let's make this the last question because we do want to end at, at one o'clock. But one of our listeners asks, Willie Jett is the third commissioner of education under Walls. Is there any indication either of the other two were pressured to resign. Uh, I've heard people, because of the timing, the last commissioner left. Who was that? Uh, I remember I, the name. I, I, it was a woman, and I, I don't want to say her name and get it wrong, because then that'll be all the comments on the video. I misidentified her. It was a woman, and she did not get reappointed for the second Walls term. And, and people say, well, it's because of her mismanagement. Or she was a commissioner of education and most students can't read. So there are lots of reasons not to retain her. And it's fairly typical for commissioners or cabinet secretaries of the federal level to not come back for a second term. So there's a lot of turnover in these positions. I'd like to believe that she was let go for cause, but I, I have no evidence of that. Yeah. Well, that's probably a good place to, uh, to leave it for now. I'm sure we'll be doing at least one more of these as the as the cases continue to wind their way through and maybe as we find out who was behind the bribery attempt uh, and, and I guess uh, bottom line this story is not going away anytime soon and Bill Glahn is going to continue to be all over it. So thanks everybody who uh, participated and uh, we'll end it right there. Mm -hmm.